Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, where we are so excited that you decided to join us today so that we can do some drawing together. Are you excited? Are you ready to draw? Well, now is the time to go ahead and get out any materials that you might need. So make sure you have some paper, or I'm actually going to be using a whiteboard and a marker. Uh, you can use crayons, you could use colored pencils, you could use even just a regular um, pencil, and then you can color it in later. Uh, you could use paint if you wanted to, or you could even use a whiteboard and some dry erase markers yourself. So it's all up to you. and you can use whatever materials you have available. But like I said, I'll be using a whiteboard. Now, as we're drawing together today, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, you can go ahead and text us at this number right here. It's 562-286-1838. And we have uh, people who are, who are ready to answer those questions and we can answer them live during our program. So my friend Alicia is over at the computer getting ready to respond to your text questions. And my friend Allie is in the studio with me getting ready to show us all these beautiful things behind me. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and start right here and look at what's behind me. So this is a webcam. So we have cameras in some of our exhibits here. And this is in our Blue Cavern exhibit, which is modeled after a real dive site off of Southern California, off of Catalina Island. And this is the type of creation, all the animals that you would find living in our waters right off our coast here in Southern California. Now, we are also going to be drawing a habitat uh, that can be found here in Southern California, but we're not going to be drawing a kelp forest habitat like this one. Instead, we're going to be focusing on a tide pool. Now, let me go back and define the word habitat. Do you know what a habitat is? A habitat is a home for an animal, a place where an animal lives. And even in the ocean, there are lots of different kinds of habitats. So a kelp forest where lots of kelp is growing is one. The deep sea could be another one. The Arctic where it's really cold and there's lots of ice and snow, that could be a different habitat. But we are going to be drawing a tide pool habitat. Now, before we get started on our drawing, I wanted to say hello to Mrs. Cheatham's. Uh, class. So 1A gray whales and 2B dolphins, um, and you are learning all about ocean habitats. So this is going to be a great opportunity for you. Now, the habitat we're going to be drawing won't be big enough for a gray whale or a dolphin to fit in, uh, but I think you'll have fun drawing it with me. But let's go ahead and take a look at what a tide pool habitat looks like. It's very different. It's not necessarily all underwater like what you're seeing here in our Blue Cavern exhibit. In a tide pool, some areas are underwater and some areas are out of the water. But we're going to take a look in just a minute and we're going to see what that looks like. I want you to imagine, actually, maybe some of you have been to a tide pool. We have tide pools all along our coast here in Southern California, which can be really fun to visit. Sometimes you go to the beach and it's nice and sandy. Other times you might go to the beach and it won't be as sandy, but it's kind of rocky. And so let's take a look at this habitat. What kinds of things do you notice in this tide pool habitat? What are the things that you see? Now remember, a habitat is made of things that are living and non-living. So do you see non-living things in this habitat? Well, I certainly don't see a whole bunch of animals all crawling around here right now, but I do see some things. What kinds of colors do you see and what are they? How would you describe them? Well, I'm noticing a lot of rocks. Now, remember, we talked about being near the beach, right near the shore. So here's some dry ground up here, and then we've got all these rocks. And what else do you see besides rocks? What is all of this right in here? And look, right there, and right there, and right there. Yeah, that's all water. So this is water that's being caught in the rocks and it's creating these little pools. And do you think there might be animals living in these pools created by the tides? You're absolutely right. So let's go ahead and we are going to start drawing a little bit of what we see. But before actually we get to drawing, let me show you another video of another tide pool. So here we see a picture of a tide pool. So you can imagine there's rocks, there's water, but what do you think it looks like if it wasn't just a picture? What if it was a video? What do you think we would be noticing about the water? Is this what you're thinking of? 
Do you see how the water's moving? So what happens in the tide pool is the water comes in and it covers over some areas, like look at this, right now it's underwater, and then the water drains out. See how the water's falling out? It's creating even little waterfalls in some of these areas. So a tide pool is an area that's constantly changing with the water coming in and water going out and lots of splashing all over the place. So let's go ahead and start drawing some of this habitat that we've been seeing so far. And let's go ahead over to my special little drawing board and let's make, well, let's start with some rocks. Now you can do rocks in all sorts of different ways. I might make them kind of bumpy, make some ledges here, maybe it coming out like this. We'll make a, another rock. I'm going to kind of trace over that. Maybe a rock over on this side. And then again, we could have some other little ledges in our rocks that other animals could be on. Maybe do a rock right here. So, okay, so we're going to create these little rocks. Now, some animals might be underwater on the rocks, but some of them are out, right? So I'm going to draw, this is going to be like the top of my water right here. So this is where the, the water line is. So up here would be the air, right? And this would be a rock that's all exposed. So what kinds of things could live in this tide pool habitat? Well, did you notice on the rocks that we were looking at that there was some kind of green color? that there's some algae. Maybe we can look back at that picture again. Um, actually, we can even find another picture. So we're gonna show you a picture right here, a still shot of what those rocks can look like. So keep in mind, you can still see the water here. So this might be a low tide, but then at other times the water might come up a little bit higher and even some of these animals will be underwater under, on these rocks. So what do you see? It might not look like animals to you, but if we were to look a little bit more closely, we might see that these little bumps right here are actually created by organisms or another, or another word for animals, animals and plants and algae that could be living. So we do have this sort of green. So do you see that green? Like there's seaweed. It can make those rocks really slippery. If you have ever been to a tide pool, um, you have to be really careful because when you step on those rocks, that algae makes it really slippery. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful. And somebody actually asked, where is a good tide pool habitat to visit in California? Well, there's lots of different ones along our rocky coast. And I know um, we have some in San Pedro and along the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, there's one by the Terranea Resort where you can walk down and see some beautiful tide pool habitats there. Uh, White's Point, I believe, is the name of the other one in San Pedro you could go to. Those are the ones closest to me that I'm most familiar with. Uh, but there's lots of different, um, anytime you see a rocky sort of shore, uh, that's where you can find a good tide pool. Okay, so what are these things? Well, these are animals called barnacles and mussels. Have you ever heard of a barnacle or mussel before? Well, maybe you've heard of mussel. And when I say mussel, I don't mean mussels like your big strong arm mussels. I'm talking about these organisms like this. They're shelled animals. So they're animals with soft bodies and they have two shells that open and close like this. This is just one of them right here. So a mussel is an animal that has a hard shell to protect itself. So here's a great picture of some mussels. So you'll notice that mussels don't usually live where there's just one. There's usually lots of mussels around. Now there's also some other special organisms here called barnacles. And there's even some different kinds of barnacles that are on the mussel shells. So you might think these just look like shells, but every shell you see is created by a living animal. And so these are barnacle shells and these are mussel shells. Let's see if we can draw some. So I'm going to come over here to my drawing board and let's just cover it up. So let's, let's look at a mussel shell here. So here's a mussel, mussel shell. And if we were to draw a mussel, they kind of have this kind of curved side here, and then maybe a little bit of a bump, and then they're a little bit straighter on this side, and then they kind of come up like this. Maybe not quite so pointed at the end, maybe a little bit more rounded. And then what I like to do is kind of draw these almost like little, these funny little C shapes, or like a backward C, or like a little ice cream cone thing, and they kind of look like that. So that's what a mussel looks like. And like I said, there's usually more than one. 
So that's a muscle. Oops, you can't see that because it's bright right there. So a muscle shell, right? Okay, and notice also on my muscle shell, do you see how it's darker on this side and then a little bit lighter down here? So even if you wanted to color in your muscle, you could start coloring it in, making it a little bit darker on one end maybe. So you could do something like that. Okay, so that's a muscle. Now, where would we draw it on our drawing? Well, we can draw it, sometimes they're underwater, so we could draw it below the waterline here. We could do something like that. And remember, there's a bunch of them usually together. In fact, I don't think you can see this very well because it's very dark. But this is a model that we have of mussels that are all living together, even with some barnacles that are growing on the shells. So mussels are usually found in big clumps. So there's small ones, there's bigger ones, all in the same sort of area. So we can kind of do a clump of mussels here. So when you draw your mussels, you can do like a little clump Maybe one peeking out this way. And there might be some that are out of the water up here. Okay, so we've got some mussels. And then we also mentioned barnacles. Now a barnacle is a funny looking animal. And here's a picture, or here's a little, um, not a picture, this is actual shell of a barnacle. So a barnacle to me, they kind of remind me of like a little volcano. Do you see like they look like a volcano? But this right here is just the outer shell of the barnacle. A barnacle is an animal that actually will cement its head onto a rock and then it sticks these little feet out of this hard shell and it grabs little tiny plankton that might be in the water. So as the water is moving around and bringing nutrients in, as the waves come in, as the waves go out, those little tiny feet are sticking out. But their feet don't look like our feet. They actually look like, almost like little eyelashes, like little hairs. And so we could draw some barnacles with some little hairs coming out of them. Uh, they're not really hairs, but they're called cirri. And we could draw them up here because there's lots of barnacles up here. Or actually, let's go ahead and let me show you a closer view of what a barnacle would look like. So a barnacle kind of looks like a volcano. So if you're drawing it almost like a little mountain up here and then down like that, because if you see the shell on its side and then it's kind of got some little edges here around the, the bottom of it right here. And they might go up a little bit like this. And then they have that hole at the top. So that's a side view of just the outer shell of the muscle. But the animal has this other covering inside. And if it's open, it sticks out these feet that kind of look like these little tiny hairs, like that. So that would be a mus, or I'm sorry, a barnacle. A barnacle. And this would be a feeding barnacle, so one that's eating right now. But a lot of times, if the water has gone away and they're out on a rock out in the open air, you might see them looking like this. If you were to look straight down at the barnacle, see how there's a hole right in the middle? This would be where the animal is living. And sometimes they have this other special opening and that opens and closes. And if we were to look at it from the top, like here's a top picture of a barnacle, they had that hole in the middle, but inside that hole, they had this other special little layer. And it's like, almost looks like little lips on the inside. So this would be a picture of us looking at the inside of a barnacle like this. And they would have these little things that look like lips. And this is all closed up. So this would be a picture of a barnacle feeding from the side. This would be a picture of a barnacle closed if you were looking at them from the top, looking down. So we can do different kinds of barnacles. We can do a lot of them up here that are probably going to be closed, right? So we'll do them in lots of clumps. And barnacles can be big. They can also be small. So we can make some smaller ones. And sometimes if you make them really small, you won't even have space to put in the details. But I'll, might, I'll try to make some bigger ones that are on this rock. And then of course, there's gonna be some barnacles down here too. So you can kind of just draw them like little tiny circles with a little tiny dot in the middle of them. Those would be your barnacles. 
But then down here underneath the water, maybe we'd find some feeding barnacles. So up on this ledge of the rock, we'll put one up here and then we'll have him sticking out his little, his little feet, his siri, to help him to feed. More barnacles, more feet coming out. All right. All right, so those are kind of some smaller creatures that live in the tide pool. But what are some other organisms that live in a tide pool? Here's one that's closed. Okay, so that's a closed barnacle. All right, now Gage, who's in Idaho right now, says, what animals can you find in tide pools? Well, Gage, you and I are thinking the same thing. And I'm wondering if any of our friends listening can think of any, if any of our friends that are watching can think of any other animals you've seen in a tide pool. Maybe we'll have my friend Allie bring up another uh, tide pool picture that we have. We actually have a tide pool here at the aquarium where we allow our guests to touch the animals in a tide pool. And this is a picture of one of our tide pool touch areas. Now, we of course make sure that people touch very gently with only two fingers as we wouldn't want to hurt any of these animals. But here's an example of some tide pool animals. Do you recognize any of them? I see quite a few. Now, do you notice they're not all the same color? There's some that are green. There's kind of some orange. There's some even purple in here. Oh, there's kind of a funny orange, brownish looking one. This one looks a little bit yellow. So these are all different types of tide pool animals. Do you recognize them? This one right here is kind of funny looking. It's called a sea anemone. Now sea anemones are really neat animals that have these long tentacles all around the outside of their bodies to help them sting and grab food. And then they grab that food and if they're gonna eat it, well, where do you think their mouth is? Where are they gonna take that food? Do you see any evidence for where their mouth is? Yeah, right there, there's that middle opening, that hole in the center is their mouth. So they have to grab their food with their tentacles, reach out and grab it, and then bring it on the inside where their mouth is. Now, when they bring that food on the inside, they actually close up. So we can draw some anemones in our tide pool as well. Now, anemones tend to be underwater a lot of the time. They wanna try to conserve their, um, their energy and their water and stay under, under, but sometimes you can see them up on the top. They look a little bit different when, than when they're on the top. But let's talk about how you would draw a sea anemone. Well, first of all, remember when we looked at one, they had that center opening where the mouth is, and then they had that outer circle. So two circles, it looks kind of like a donut. And then they have this long foot that they use to attach onto the rock. All right, so it almost looks like a tree trunk. But what was the really special thing about the anemones? all those tentacles sticking up like that. So the tentacles can be really flowy and go lots of different directions. Um, sometimes they might look kind of straight up like that, but then as they're moving around, sometimes they're kind of flowing this way and that way. And then even some anemones are really beautiful on the inside. They have these really pretty lines that kind of lead down to their mouth. Or you could also draw a sea anemone from the side. Like if you have a rock up here, you could just go like this and kind of do like the scooped out thing right there and draw his little foot hanging onto the rock and then draw his tentacles going like this. And you don't even have to draw the mouth. You can just draw all these tentacles sticking up. So those are sea anemones. So where would you want to draw a sea anemone on here? Well, let's try drawing one from the side over on our picture this way. So we'll draw him, we'll draw him hanging out with his little foot and we'll draw all these tentacles. Tentacles going up like this and then reaching out to the side. All right, and then maybe draw one that's looking right at us like this. You can see some of his his mantle or his foot sticking out and his big long tentacles. We'll make his tentacles everywhere. All right, so we've got some sea anemones, but we also might see some sea anemones up here in the shallower areas. And so from the side view, 
some of them might be closed and they might look just kind of like that. You might have another anemone next to him that's open and he's got some of his little tentacles sticking out, but maybe not all of them. Maybe there's another one nearby over here who's got some of his tentacles sticking out. So there can be lots of different places where the anemones can be. All right, now, Dana and Darian also said anemones. Dana and Darian, I like what you're thinking. And somebody asked, do crabs live in tide pools? Well, yes, they do. And somebody also said, do snails live in tide pools? And yes, they do. Both of those are great examples of animals that live in a tide pool. So let's take a look at a snail. In fact, one of my favorite types of snails is called a cowrie. Now, this is a shell of a cowrie shell. Now, this is, or a cowrie snail. It's a type of a snail that has this really pretty shell. It's very smooth. It's kind of rounded, and it looks kind of like a big, kind of like a big lump or a lemon, but it's flat on the bottom. So it's kind of like this. And then at the, the end down here, it has this other little kind of lip that comes up like that. So it's kind of funny looking. Now, the ones that we see around here in Southern California are what we call chestnut cowries. This is a cowrie shell from an animal that was in a tropical area. But this is what we see very commonly off our coast. And they're so pretty. They have this really smooth shell. And then they also have this, they have what's called a mantle as well that will come up and it's got these little polka dots on it. And they use this to polish their shell. So they'll bring it up over the top of their shell and kind of polish it, make it all shiny. See how shiny this is? That's from the mantle of the snail, the cowrie. And then the cowrie also has these really bright orange tentacles uh, that it sticks out, little antenna that it sticks out from the front of its head uh, to help to help it see its way around and figure its way around the tide pool. So let's see if we can draw a cowrie. That's the chestnut cowrie. Now, do you notice, oops, I'll, I'll have you bring that back up again. Did you notice on our chestnut cowrie how it's really dark at the top? It's got this brown chestnut color. That's why it's called chestnut. And it's got kind of this little ledge around the edge and then it gets really white. So it's got this really light color around the outside edges and up here, but it's really dark around the top. So. If I were to draw the side view of my little cowrie, I would kind of do this kind of color up here, make it a little bit darker, kind of color it in. Sometimes it's even, they even have a darker line like right here and then it's a little bit lighter up there. And then they have their body that comes out all around the outside edge and they have these two bright orange antenna that stick up like this. Oops, except I should probably draw him inside there. All right, so again, if you're looking at, here's another picture of a cowrie shell. Chestnut cowries are not very big. They only grow to be about this size. But this is another picture. You can see the bottom of their shell is really unique. It's really special. It has, almost looks like little tiny teeth. And that's the area where their body will hide inside when they want to, sh to hide inside for protection. So we could draw some chestnut cowries in different places on our rocks. We could draw one down here. Remember, it's kind of like that. It has that little special thing at the end. And the reason why I'm drawing them big on here is because a lot of these animals are pretty small. And if you were to put them in a tide pool, they're going to be pretty small and hard to see all the details. So it's a little bit easier to learn how to draw them when they're up here. So we'll put their little head and their little body. Maybe there's another one down here. His little antenna and his slimy body. We can color that in. Okay, so this is called a cowrie. C-O-W-R-I-E. All right, and then we also mentioned uh, crabs. So yes, there can be crabs. Now, how would you draw a crab? Well, there's lots of different kinds of crabs you can draw. And I'm no expert in drawing crabs, but let's see. I don't, maybe we can find a picture of a crab we can look at. But a lot of times crabs have kind of a roundish body like this, or even it can be oval. And then they've got these little, they have these jointed appendages. So a joint is an area like your elbow. So if you think about your elbow, it allows your bones, your bones are stiff like this, 
but right here it allows them a point where they can move. Otherwise we'd be walking around like this all the time. But we have joints like in our fingers. So any parts where your fingers are moving like this or your knee is a joint and even your ankle. And that helps us to move. Well, these are animals that don't have skeletons on the inside of their body. Instead, the outside of their body is hard. But they still have joints that allow them to move. So you can see the coolest thing about the crabs are their big pinchers, right? Up in front. And this one has black pinchers in front. And notice how it's kind of this orangish reddish color. This is a red crab. So, and of course, there's two eyes. So let's see if we can draw something like that. So we've got these kind of joints that are coming out here, but then he's got these other joints and these big claws. So we can draw some claws on him and this one will give him some eyes. Now they also have other little legs. They've got five total on each side, but we can't draw all those. I don't really have a space for them. And we can draw a crab. Crabs can be underwater. Or they can be out of the water. So maybe we might be able to draw a little small crab up here. Because there are little crabs they call pea crabs <laughs> that can also be found in the ocean and on rocks and also in the sandy bottom areas. So that could be a crab. It's kind of hard to tell when it's small like this. But it looks like we have frozen. So hopefully we can unfreeze our picture and you guys can see us. But I'm just gonna write in here crab. But hopefully, let's go see. Okay, looks like, well, we'll see if we can get that fixed. But we do have some questions. So let me go ahead and answer some questions. Um, Genevieve wants to know how deep are tide pools? That's a great question because it changes all the time. So some can be very shallow, not covered with water at all. And other times they might be, oh, a few feet under the water. Uh, so it depends. And actually going out deeper, depending on if it's a high tide when the water comes up really, really high, or if it's a low tide when the water has gone out really far. Um, when it comes up really far, the areas that are deeper out into the ocean might be um, several feet under the water. Uh, so it can vary. But here you can see some animals that are exposed and that aren't out um, under the water. But look at how these sea anemones are kind of closed up. Do you notice that there are no tentacles that we can see? They've hidden them all inside their body. And when you go to a tide pool, you might be thinking that you're stepping on some just slippery um, algae or seaweed covered rocks. But make sure you're not stepping on any anemones because they can look kind of like seaweed too, all closed up. They look kind of like fuzzy rocks. Uh, but you could also draw some sea anemones all closed up on your drawing. Now, of course, these are some of the most obvious residents of the tide pool, the sea stars. And so let's go back. I think we have our thing unfrozen now. Let's go back and draw a sea star. Now, there's different ways you can draw a sea star because drawing a star can be kind of hard. If you think about it, going up like this, out like this. This is kind of how I like to do them. But this is, this is really hard to draw a sea star. But the nice thing is, is sea stars are not perfect stars. So if you look at this sea star right here, it's not perfect. It has kind of some curves to it. So one of the things that's kind of cool is to actually have put your sea star with some curves. So maybe put some curves on the end of your sea star. That's kind of neat. Notice this one has lots of bumps all over its body. So you might want to do that can add some little spots or bumps. But then there's also other ways you could draw a sea star. You could try drawing it. Like if you just kind of do a, a drawing like this, well, then what you could do is kind of put these little points in between, and then you kind of do a connect the dots. So you connect from here to here, 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 here. here all around your sea star. And then you can just color it in. So that's another way you can make a sea star. Another thing you could do is draw, if you've ever tried drawing a star like this, sometimes this is the first way I could ever draw a star. And then you color in those lines. And then one thing I like to do is draw these sea stars. This is called a bat star. And they look like they have wet in between their arms and notice how it's curved in the middle. So if I take my drawing that I just did here and I make it curved, I 
kind of fill in that space. Now it looks a lot like a bat star. So this is a bat star. And there's lots of different kinds of sea stars in the ocean and in the tide pools. So let's go ahead and really quickly draw some stars on our, and usually they have five arms. Oh, I gotta push it up a little bit. Oh, I'm getting too low. Oop, a little bit more. Well, he'll be off my drawing, I guess. I'll try drawing another one up here. We'll make a bigger one. Okay, and there's lots of questions coming in. So let me try answering those questions. And you guys can fill in some sea stars all over your drawing. I'm going to draw another one down here. And remember, they have arms that can be not always straight. They can be different shapes. Okay, so August wants to know, is that an exoskeleton? And August, if you were talking about the crab, then absolutely, that is the exoskeleton. So this right here, this hard part, is called the exoskeleton. It's their skeleton on the outside of their body. So great question, August. And Lucas says, does an octopus live in a tide pool? And absolutely, an octopus can live in a tide pool as well. Um, they usually are the smaller ones, not the big giant Pacific octopus uh, that we often show pictures of here uh, at the aquarium because we have a really great octopus exhibit with the, what we call a GPO for giant Pacific octopus. Uh, but usually the smaller octopuses might be ones that you find in the tide pools. Now those are going to be the ones that stay in the water. Uh, so as the tide goes out, they're going to be in the deeper parts. And then Evan also said scorpion fish. And yes, Evan, even scorpion fish are fish that can be found in the pool areas, the water areas of a tide pool. Scorpion fish are not going to come out of the water like the crabs can, or the barnacles, or the mussels, or the sea stars can. Um, they are always under the water. And then Benicio says, how do anemones reproduce? So these anemones that you see right here that are flowing with the water, they actually can reproduce all by themselves. Some of them can actually split up and they can turn their one body into two bodies and start to split up that way. That's one way that they can do it. They can also release their eggs into the water that will just kind of find each other, and then they'll settle down and grow into new anemones. So there's different ways that an anemones can reproduce. And then Darian also mentioned sea urchins. So those are another type of tide pool animal that we can draw. And I'm glad you mentioned that because those are the easiest ones to draw. Look at them. They're like these big spiky balls. So balls with spikes all over them. So I can actually come over here real, really quick. If you wanted to draw, I don't think I even need to do it on this big page. We can just draw some spiky balls. So just make some, some spikes coming out like this. Those are sea urchins. So sea urchins, if you wanted to, a side view of one, making it, make that core, that center ball, and then all those spikes coming off like that. You can maybe draw one over here. So yeah, sea urchins are fun to draw because they've got spines that stick out all over their bodies. All right, so we've got the sea urchins. Okay, what other questions do we need to answer? Genevieve said, oh, we said, how deep are tide pools? But also, do any animals eat barnacles? Oh, yes. Actually, did you remember how the barnacles are oftentimes out of the water too? So there are also birds that will prey on barnacles and um, could be other animals like those crabs that we were seeing earlier. They might be barnacle um, predators, but I know that uh, here's a great picture. Here's some barnacles. So there's those little volcano looking shells that they have and then they live on the inside. Here's some smaller ones down there. These are different. These are gooseneck barnacles that have a longer neck, but those are a type of barnacle as well. Yeah, oh, and remember that muscle right there? So there's lots of tide pool animals in this picture. Uh, but these can be preyed upon by other birds and animals that don't necessarily live under the water. Uh, but there probably are some other predators that I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, probably even sea stars will eat uh, the barnacles. So I could be wrong. I'll see if somebody corrects me. Okay, and then let's see, Evan mentioned catfish as an animal that could be in a tide pool. Uh, so a type of, there are some looking, some pretty funny looking animals that look kind of like catfish. Um, catfish generally are found in freshwater. Uh, there are some uh, what we call stinging catfish, which can be found around um, 
in the warmer waters, not necessarily in a tide pool. Uh, but yeah, so there are some other types of fish. Eileen says, do you know barnacles can be black? Oh, did I know? Ah, so I don't know if we have any pictures of any black barnacles, but I'm sure that there are barnacles that can be black. Oftentimes we think about them as being kind of the cream color. You can even see them on whales, especially gray whales, which are a type of whale that comes along our coast and they have these little white spots or kind of yellowish cream colored uh, circles on their body. Those are from, those are the barnacles. And then what animals eat in tide pools? Or so what do animals eat in tide pools? Um, it can depend. A lot of the sea stars like to uh, prey on other tide pool animals. They probably have the biggest appetite of any animal in the tide pool. But before we go, I wanted to leave you with one more sea star, a type of sea star that's called a brittle star because they are so easy to draw. And because we talked about different types of sea stars here, a brittle star is one that's just all you need is a little circle and then you just make these crazy little loopy arms. They have five arms just like other sea stars, but they can stretch them and then they've got these little tiny spines all over the outside edge of them. And this is what's called a brittle star and they're so fun to draw and they're so fun to watch when they move. And then they have these little tiny things in the middle. But this is the middle part of them, and this is called a brittle star. B-R-I-T-T-L-E, star. So if you wanted to draw a brittle star on your drawing, just draw a circle and lots of wavy arms. Well, five of them, they only have five. And they're called brittle stars because their arms are very brittle, which means that they can break off very easily. And so you have to be very delicate and gentle with a brittle star. Oops, drew it too low. All right, now I think there are a couple other questions that I'll answer real quick as you guys are drawing brittle stars. But I just think they're fun to draw. Oh, and actually it is time. We've gone over so long drawing. But you can also text in your questions. Um, you can contact us and we would love to see any photos that you have of the drawings that you made today as we were exploring tide pool animals. You can um, text us at 562-286-1838. You can email us as well at live at lbaop.org that you see on your screen if you're watching this at a later time or if you wanted to send in your question to us at that time um, in that way. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so sorry we have to end. Um, and I do want to say, though, how do anemones get their colors? Is it their food? That's actually something I'm not quite sure of, Simone. Simone was asking that because there are so many different colors. Um, so some of it is because of the algae that's actually inside of their body. Uh, so some of these green colors you're seeing is coming from the algae that they have that's getting that sunlight and giving them their color. Um, but different sea star or different sea anemones are different colors. Um, and exactly why that is, I don't know. So good question. Uh, but again, we will get to all of your questions and give them answers to you by text um, if we didn't get a chance to respond to them during the program. But thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Bye.